Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good? Hopefully, uh, you've had a uh, chance to grab a bite to eat. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about housing uh, beyond the first year. Uh, is everyone enjoying their uh, re reuniting with their son and daughter this weekend? Yeah? Okay. Awesome. Oh, hug. That's great. <laughs> Who, out of curiosity, uh, attended a class? I saw that. Wow, that's a lot. That makes sense, though. Life learners, parents. Uh, and did anyone attend physics? By chance? No one attended physics. I was wondering if anyone attended physics. <laughs> that's, no, that's great. I, I'm sure physics is very interesting. I was telling the, the group before you, but, um, but definitely for, for people uh, smarter than myself. So uh, I'm sure it's extremely interesting. Not, not for me, though. Uh, anyway, so I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we understand that your time is very valuable, and we uh, very much appreciate you spending some time with us, and we hope we'll be able, be able to be as, as informative as the uh, professors that, uh, that taught you over the weekend. Um, just a, a quick rundown of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be going through um, each of the residential communities on campus, uh, including uh, off-campus housing, the off-campus housing office, and what services they can provide to your son or daughter um, if, if they're inclined to live off-campus for next year. Um, we're also going to be going uh, or, um, reviewing the room assignment dates, some important dates on how to secure housing, So, and that will be on the tail end. So we're going to try to uh, have about a 45-minute presentation about um, total, so about half an hour of us talking to you. And then if you can hold your questions till the end, uh, we're going to have about 15 minutes. That's our goal uh, for questions um, in the audience. This is a smaller audience, so it's great. So we can, I think we'll be able to answer everyone's questions. Before we get started, though, I did want to introduce the panel. We've been really lucky to have um, some great colleagues uh, to take a Saturday and sit down uh, with myself to um, help you better understand the housing for next year. To my immediate left is Barnaby Noel Barnaby is the residence hall director at the Schuyler House uh, in Lower College Town. Um, joined Cornell two years ago from the uh, state of Indiana, hails from Indiana. Uh, to Barnaby's left is Angel, and Angel um, came from Texas State University in St. Marcus, Texas, uh, not too far away from where I grew up in Austin, uh, so fellow Texan. Uh, to Angel's left is Jared Anthony. Jared is uh, the assistant dean at Flora Rose House, um, and he came to the university two years ago uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, to Jared's left is Julie Page. Julie is the assistant dean of students, oversees uh, independent living, um, and is a leader and mentor to the cooperative university-owned cooperative houses. Uh, and to Julie's left is Denise Thompson. Denise oversees the office of off-campus housing, and you've probably spoken to her or your son or daughter have um, already if they've uh, called the numbers. Wonderful to work with. And last but not least is Sandy Davenport. Sandy works in um, our office in the Office of Residential Event Services. And Sandy is the undergraduate housing coordinator, uh, has over 40 years of experience, um, which is really great for us. <laughs> so, uh, so to begin, we're, I'm going to hand it to Barnaby. He's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the upper level residence halls. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, real quick, I'd like to say thanks, like Carl said, for coming out. Uh, there are a lot of programs going on on campus today, and I'm really glad that you guys came to this, because uh, housing is really one of the, I guess, the most important things uh, that go on on a college campus. And it's really uh, one of the things that uh, the majority of students actually spend their time at is in their home, like either studying, hanging out with friends, or eating. So it's a pretty, it's a, it's a really good session today, so thank you all for coming out. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is upperclassmen housing. And it's kind of similar to uh, the first year housing options that a lot of you are already familiar with. Um, so it's similar in terms of uh, programming, staffing. We have RAs uh, who are in charge of floors and who are in charge of programming and just helping students out with general questions that they may have. And, uh, there's residence hall directors, which, which is what I do, in charge of every building. So it's like a professional staff member who's there to answer questions and to also help with programming. And one of the things that's really unique to Cornell is faculty involvement. Uh, 
Um, so all of our halls uh, have uh, some sort of faculty fellow uh, program that where the faculty come in and either have dining discussions or uh, just generally hang out with students and come up with programs and activities. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is, I guess, just a general run through of the buildings that are uh, known as like the upperclassmen residence hall. Uh, the first one um, is 122 McGraw. It's not technically a part of the uh, West Campus system that Jared's going to talk about in a minute. Uh, it's just really close to that uh, to the, the West Campus system, uh, I guess in proximity. Um, so it's kind of tucked away a little bit north of West Campus. And it's a really beautiful area. It's kind of right next to the gorge, to the Fall Creek Gorge. And then it also has really nice views of Cayuga Lake and the entire town. It's a really nice area. And there are about 30 students in 122 McGraw. And there's singles, doubles, and a few triples in there. And they also have a, a really good amount of studying space uh, and just meeting rooms. So people, if you want to have a group, a group discussion or work on a class project. There are a lot of opportunities in the space for that. Um, and then on the larger side, um, I guess we'll go over to, I guess, the upper college town area. And the first one is Cascadilla Hall. And it holds about 375 people. And when I think about this place, I think of like a really huge Italian castle or fortress, uh, which is kind of big and kind of not imposing, uh, but it just, it has this great presence and it's got really great stone architecture on the outside. Um, so if you get a chance and you're in the College Town area today, you might want to just kind of stop by and just look at it. It's a little off the main strip in College Town and it has some singles and doubles available for everybody. Um, and it's a really great social atmosphere um, just in general because you're really close to campus and there's a lot of really great proximity to uh, the Schwartz Theater and a lot of other um, and then the next one is Sheldon Court. There's about 165 students there in singles and doubles. And it's actually right across from College Town Bagel. So if you guys didn't get lunch yet and you're starving after this, uh, you can go up to the College Town area and there's tons of restaurants, pizza places, burrito places, uh, Chinese, Indian, there's a subway. Uh, just about everything you want is in that College Town area as far as food is concerned. Um, and then there is 112 Edgemore, and it's a smaller building with about 20 students in it, and it's mainly, or it's all single student or single rooms. Um, and it kind of has the feeling like a co-op that Julie Page will talk about here in a little bit, uh, but it still has an RA, and there still are, um, I guess the facilities are run by the university. And then the last one on the list is Schuyler House, and Schuyler House is the residence hall that I oversee. And it kind of has the feeling of an off-campus uh, environment, but still, uh, it's still a university-owned property. It's halfway between College Town and the Commons, so it's a really great area. Uh, students really like it because uh, they're just so close to the Commons. So if you go uh, out for dinner tonight, you might want to go check out the Commons if you didn't get a chance to see it uh, during the weekend. And there are just tons of great restaurants and activities and just general things going on in that area. Um, and if you live in Schuyler, they, we also offer a free bus pass to everyone. And uh, there's also a service center in Schuyler, as well as in Casadella. So it's where all your mail comes and your packages, so you don't really have to go out anywhere to get your things. Um, and all of our areas have kitchens and lounges throughout the building for either studying or just hanging out in general. Um, so the College Town area has its own meal plan, uh, which is actually a, a really popular meal plan. It gives students a lot of options. Uh, so it's 750 big red bucks, uh, which is just like dining dollars that you can use in different uh, deck you can use on campus. And then you also get 10 meal swipes. And it's a really popular program for the people who live there. It really gives you a lot of independence. You can go out and you know eat in College Town if you want, but you can also still go on campus. It has that, uh, I guess, that luxury. Um, programming in the areas, it is kind of similar to what you think of when you think of uh, like the traditional first year residence halls. Uh, but we kind of do a little bit more for geared towards upperclassmen students. Uh, 
Um, so we do a lot of you know, resume workshops, internship possibilities, and just general social events to get people involved and I guess uh, take a break from studying so much. Um, let's see. We also do some large scale events in the area, like uh, College Town area does, it's called Nightmare in Edgemore, which is like a, a big haunted, haunted Halloween, haunted house. Uh, they do a haunted house for students, and then, yeah, it's just a great area. So if you're in College Town on that weekend, it's just, you'll see a really, a wide variety of really cool uh, costumes, a lot of great students, so. And all these houses also, like I said, have a faculty fellow connection. They just do just general programs and get students involved and uh, to let them meet a lot of faculty people on campus. And I want to give a real quick plug um, to the RA student selection. So the RA is the person who kind of supervises the floor and is in charge of programming and just uh, making sure students are well adjusted on campus. And so that process is coming up pretty soon. Uh, we're actually doing information sessions right now. And if you're interested, uh, you can come down and ask me about the information sessions after this. And I really think it's one of the greatest opportunities between the RA job and the, uh, this, the SA job on West Campus with Jared. Uh, it's really one of the best opportunities I think you can get as an undergraduate because um, the majority of jobs and you know, just everything after college really revolves around communication and I think the RA job is that opportunity where you really get to communicate with more people in the shortest amount of time you could ever imagine and you deal with people from different cultures, different environments, different points of view. And you really kind of have to work with all of them to get them to get everyone together on the same page and you know just enjoy living there. And you also get to plan programs and activities. And so you get a free single room on campus and as well as a five hundred dollar stipend per semester and a twenty percent discount on uh, your meal plan. So it offers a lot of really great perks for first year. Thanks. So, um, hi, my name is Angel Keen, and I'm the residence hall director for Dixon, which is a first year community, but also McClue, which is also a um, multicultural living learning unit. Um, and so I'm just gonna talk to you about the themed uh, program houses that we have, which are on North Campus. Uh, the first one is Aguego, which is the American Indian themed house. Um, it's a small community of about 30 to 35 students. And it's run just like a first year community in the sense that you have a residence hall director that lives in the building. Um, there are RAs, depending on the size of the community, they go from two um, to about, I think it's about six, depending on the different buildings. But you also do have faculty fellows, which are connected to the building, which are faculty that have shown an interest and are in the uh, faculty programs uh, system, which they do programming with the students, and they do a, each one of them do at least two programs per semester within the buildings. Um, and Aguego does, uh, its main purpose is to educate students um, and immerse them into the American Indian culture, particularly the Cayuga Nation, which uh, are from these lands. And so if you've ever seen the building, I think there's a picture um, on the next slide, but it's the one that has really cool designs on the side, and it's purple, um, uh, close to Trip Hammer in the very back of North Campus. Um, and so uh, it's a really great opportunity. Some of the programs that they do is they work a lot with the American Indian program. Recently they had the first People's Festival a couple weeks ago, which was one to uh, show the different cultures and uh, handicrafts of the American Indians of this area. Um, and so the hall director went to go speak there, as well as some students, um, they, the RAs took some of the students there to come and see the festival. It was going on at the same time as that festival. Um, the other one that we have is the Ecology House, which that one is a little further, it's down Trip Hammer after the Africana Center. Um, and it's a really beautiful area because it's uh, lots of greenery. They even have their own uh, garden. And the Ecology House is based off of the idea of sustainability. So a lot of the programs around that um, and educating them about uh, pretty much the relationship between us as within society and the environment. And so they have their own compost system within the house as well as some of the programs that they do is what's called Mission Wolf, which is actually on October 30th. It's coming up. And they bring, Mission Wolf is a program that comes from Cal, uh, Colorado, I'm sorry. And they basically educate society about the importance of wolves and how they uh, are important to the ecosystem because they're trying to reintroduce them to the Anirondacks. And so it's an 
it's actually a program that is open to the entire community of Ithaca, but it's run by the Ecology House, and they're celebrating, I think it's their 20th anniversary. Um, the other house that we have is the Holland International uh, Living Center, um, in which is a program house that particularly focuses on the interna international aspect um, of education and immersion. Um, some of the programs that they do is they do the international dinner. Um, some students either they learn how to make a dish or they're from uh, a, a different culture, cult, uh, country or culture. So they make different dishes to represent different um, identities. And it's a big dinner that's open to all the students. And it's great because the students make a dish, they educate each other about where the dish comes from, what was particularly makes it different. Um, so it's a great exposing opportunity for students. Other trips that they do is they take students to, um, for those who can't go home for uh, Thanksgiving, they take them to go see a Broadway show in New York City. As well, this is the only building on our campus that is actually open year round. So it's open from August until May. So it's open during the winter session. Um, the other one is just about music, which is also known as jam. Um, their programming is more towards the, the variety of different types of music, the history, um, how some of them are associated to different cultures, how they came about. So some of the programs that they do is, for example, they worked with my community, Maku, and we did a Cuban culture night, and they got a Cuban salsa band um, to come and play for the students, uh, for students to learn how to play salsa, but also understand the cultural aspect of um, uh, salsa and like how it came about, like why is it important to Cuba. Um, they also have a concert series, which there's one coming up soon where they're bringing a, a rock band, um, and also they have a few opening acts as well. And it's a big night, and every month or so they'll be doing a different uh, type of music or genre um, and having a concert within the building. The other one is the Latino Living Center, uh, which is a small community of about 50 to 55 students, um, and it's a house where they uh, open students to the Latino culture as well as the Latino heritage um, and a lot of the programs surround that uh, educational aspect and um, they also do what's called Cafe Con Leche which is a coffee night on Friday evenings so it's an alternative night option to um, be in the building and immerse yourself among your residents, um, your fellow colleagues and they do different topics. They work a lot with the Latino Studies program um, on Central Campus, but some topics that they've had is, they worked with Aguego to talk about uh, mestizo, which is the mix of indigenous cultures uh, with uh, civilization when they were getting uh, first founded, um, different things like that. Um, also, they do study breaks. The other building is McClue, which is a multicultural learning unit that I do. And it's a really fun building because it's not particular to one idea, it's multiculturalism in general. And so it's a great opportunity for students to broaden their aspects of understanding the differences between race, ethnicity, religion, economic status, background, more than just what people normally think of diversity in just a couple of categories, as well as they talk about different political views. For example, they've done a lot of programming called McClunity Nights or McClue Chai Chats about the debates. They also watch the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National uh, National Convention so that students have a safe space to talk about their different views, educate themselves about what's going on, kind of understand why, what the different sides are, but have a safe space to talk about that and not kind of get turned down for, for wanting to learn more about it or stating their opinion. Um, also, Risley uh, Residential College is a creative and performing arts uh, community. And so if you ever get a chance to go into this building, it's absolutely amazing. There's so many different murals in there that students themselves have painted. They actually have their own resident uh, dining hall um, within the building. But it's a very active community. They do their own uh, actual theatrical shows. They, I just went to one last night, The Little Shop of Horrors, and it's something that's directed by students and put together by students. Um, and just so happens, the, one of the RHD for the building um, actually was in the show. Um, but you audition, and it's a very well done show with lighting and everything. Um, and they do other things as well as they have shops um, for different times of the year. They'll have uh, how to make stained glass items. Um, they also have pottery making, uh, jewelry making, dance studios, etc. And then the, uh, the last house is uh, Uj Ujima Residential College, which is a house to represent um, the African diaspora or what others mention as the African or African American house. Um, and so it's a, 
house the community that is to educate students about the African diaspora, the history, the different cultures, the different identities within that umbrella. So some of the programs that they do is, for example, recently Danny Glover came to speak at the university and he did a, a small program within the house. I um, came to speak about um, different things about identity as well as different works that he's done as, as an activist. Um, and then also they do a big trip to the UN. One of their faculty fellows actually is a professor here at the university, but she used to work at the UN. And so they do a tour, uh, it's coming up November 30th, they do a tour of the UN, but it's very particular because since she used to work there, she works with the people that she knows and they do a panel of topics that the students have been, that want to go have selected and they, they have a big panel for them. So it's very specifically tailored to our students and we also have about 30 students join us from Columbia. So it's a very unique opportunity because of the fact that we have that connection um, within the building. Um, so yeah, so yeah, those are our themed houses, and like I said, they're they're great. In my personal experience with uh, the Multicultural Living Learning Unit, it's amazing. The students come from different backgrounds. Um, they have such a great want to learn about what is out there, about each other, asking questions that sometimes they don't get the opportunity to ask in class. And also they come up with, like, for example, we're doing a trip to New York City to go to the Museum of Tolerance in New York, um, which is a they have one here and they have one in California, which is a museum to, for people to understand what it is to be tolerant of others and how some people have experienced where people are intolerant and how to deal with that and how it affects um, the community and students are just so interested to learn and I have really enjoyed working with them. Um, the great thing is a lot of people tend to think that program houses, because they're on North Campus, that they're you know only for freshmen, but actually 65% of our residents are upperclassmen. Um, and so for some students who either get to stay their freshman year or they get to live their sophomore, some of them tend to stay all throughout their, uh, till their senior year here in those houses because they like the environment. So, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jared Anthony, and I'm here today to talk to you about the West Campus House System. I'm assistant dean of Fort Rose, which is actually the newest of the houses. Um, the West Campus House System, is organized in five distinct houses listed above. Um, they consist of five um, buildings, newly constructed buildings in the past five or 10 years, as well as they incorporate Gothics on West Campus. These are um, really beautiful stately buildings from the built, I think mostly in the 1920s. And those buildings have been associated with um, several of the houses. So that's, that's the organization of the house system. If the house system had a tagline, it would be bringing students and faculty together in a spirit of inquiry and active citizenship. And to that end, what we really try to do is make it easy for the sophomores, juniors, and seniors who live in the house system to take advantage of all the um, all Cornell has to offer in terms of its research communities and um, and just to prepare them to participate as citizens, you know, within their own house, but also um, outside of Cornell. So our program tends to um, emphasize the development of leadership skills, as well as just creating informal interactions between students and faculty members. Each of the houses is led by a, a live-in house professor who, um, has an apartment in the house and who often hosts events in that apartment. And the house professor is really responsible for the programmatic aspect of the house and sort of creating a vibrant intellectual life within the house. Then there, each house has an assistant dean, like me, who's sort of over the day-to-day -day operations of the house. Every house has five to six graduate resident fellows. These are graduate students who act as role models within the house, as well as trying to create a sort of more neighborhood -y type atmosphere. Because these are large communities, and so we try to break them down. And that's part of the role of the graduate students in the house. Um, we have three student assistants in every house. Those students are really peer mentors who live in with residents and among residents. Each house has 30 house fellows. These are faculty members as well as senior administrators who really participate in the life of the house in terms of they come every, often they come on Wednesdays for, we have a large house dinner. House dinners are sort of a special night where we bring out the linens and uh, 
and silver and just create a really special um, get together over food. Um, and probably, actually, if you ask students the most important part of the house, they wouldn't mention the house professor first. They certainly wouldn't mention the assistant dean. They would mention our house chefs. Every single house has its own dining room, and the chef plans the meals and sort of also supports the academic mission of the house by providing food for you know, special events and so on and so forth. Um, I should also add that each house has its own governing um, house council. And the house council is really responsible for, again, building community within the house, sort of really giving each house its own flavor. Because these houses, I should mention, by the way, they don't have particular identities. Even if the house is named after someone like Hans Bethe, who's a you know, famous scientist, that doesn't mean that it's the science house. Um, we really try to keep each population in every house very diverse um, to allow for that sort of rich um, exchange of experiences and ideas. I'll just end by sort of trying to give you a specific example of the sort of programming we do within the house system. So um, just a couple of weeks ago, one of our house fellows at Rose House is Henry Gearson. He's the head of the psychiatry department at Cayuga Medical Center. And he came to the house and gave a talk in the house professor's apartment about managing pretest stress. So how you actually use stress to your advantage to perform better in a test situation. And that's the, those are the sorts of intellectual um, and, um, yeah, it's the sort of intellectual opportunities we try to create. That's a good example. And finally, I should also mention that we have Alice Cook House um, houses the Language House program, which is an opportunity for students who are really interested in building their communication skills in a particular language to uh, live among other students who are sort of committed to speaking that language on their floor at all times, and each language program has its own native speaker who sort of facilitates the, uh, the learning environment in that, um, in that context. And with that, I'll turn it over to Julie Page, who will talk about co-ops. I should also mention that Julie is an expert on local dining in Ithaca. She's introduced me to some of the best restaurants in Ithaca, so if you want to know where to eat tonight, you should turn on her. So, good afternoon, and welcome back to Cornell. I'm um, glad you're here. So I'm here to talk about the eight university-owned cooperatives. Um, very, they're small houses, um, but we have three houses on West Campus, uh, Bob Prom 660 and Water Margin. And then we have five houses on North Campus, Prospect and Whitby, 308 Wake Terrace, 302 Wade Avenue, Trip Hammer, and Wari House. So um, the houses range in size. Um, our smallest house is Wari with 10 women. And our largest house is Bonham Prom with 35 members, which is co-ed. Um, the co-ops are really an exceptional kind of housing um, opportunity on campus. Um, they're totally self-governing. So there's no staff, there's no RAs, there's no residence hall directors, house assistant deans. Um, but they work with me. Um, and I basically am their partner in running a success, partner with the officers in running a successful living experience. Um, I serve as a crisis manager backup um, to the officers. I train the officers on recognizing if a student is under duress or under stress and um, who to reach out to in the university. Um, I lead them on, um, on building good house dynamics. Um, there's also a group, uh, facilities manager that I work with in um, the Office of Attorneys for Royal Independent Living, and he guides them through the facilities management process the routine maintenance and planning for capital projects. Um, there's also, um, I have a colleague in our business service end who helps with the financial management. Um, the self-governance does met, uh, vary from house to house. Um, the smallest house might have two and three officers, where the larger houses could have seven officers. Um, they have great programs within the co-ops too. Water Margin, um, one of our larger co-ops on West Campus, was founded on um, building um, social consciousness and diversity. Uh, Wari House, which is on North Campus, was founded in 1968 to provide black women a safer place on campus to live during a very turbulent time. Um, they, have, they host faculty dinners um, at the co-ops. Last um, Saturday night, I had the wonderful experience of having dinner at Bonk Prom. It's part of Bonk Prom Cares, and they um, raised money um, for a program in Ecuador 
to send to make sure students had transportation to go to high school. And a student from the program from the co-op did a presentation on this program, and then we were served a three-course dinner that the students cooked themselves. Um, today, many of the co-op members are participating in um, uh, into the streets, a community service program. They also have a governing body called the Intercooperative Council. As far as facilities management goes and financial management, um, the room rates will range from $4,500 to $6,000 a year, um, and they are bursar built, so um, just like um, the residence hall plans. Um, they also, the co-ops do have meal plans, um, a dinner plan, and that's also bursar billable. Um, there's no housekeeping staff in the co-op, so students do all the housekeeping themselves. And so when you bring your son or daughter to move into a co-op um, in August, you might not quite be as pleased with the cleanliness of the house. I try to work with them on this, but their idea is the first weekend after classes, they all get together, they build a team, cl clean the house, so when you come a month later, you don't even feel like you're in the same house when you drop your son or daughter off. So just a little patience um, with that. Um, some of the, the co-ops are all open year-round, so some students who um, live far away do not go home during winter break. Um, some of the co-ops really open themselves up to exchange students. So we have students from all over the world that live in these houses and um, can't go home during winter break, so they are open. They're also open during the summer, so if a student wants to stay during the summer, they can um, most likely stay in the room that they have for the academic year. But there is an, ex an extra, a, a separate contract for the summer, and there's a separate payment plan. Uh, five of the houses have um, meal, dinner meal plans. Um, there's no cook in the house, there's no house chef, but the students cook and plan the meals themselves. So these houses have food stewards, menu stewards, who actually plan the menus, um, order the food, um, they really concentrate on local food, um, very committed to the environment, sustainability, and then each student participates in a cook group. So I might be in the Tuesday night cook group, but I'm cooking dinner with a couple other people for 35 other students. And I've been at these dinners, and they're fabulous. Better than my home cooking. Um, how do the students go about living in one of the co-ops? Um, we have a recruitment process called Mosey. Um, Mosey's kind of the opposite of Rush. Rush, Rush um, they rush through the co uh, the, to try to get into a fraternity, they mosey into the co-op. Yes. So, uh, the first day of Mosey Open House is Sunday, February 3rd, it's an afternoon, and students get to visit all the co-ops that they want to, or just the co-ops that they're interested in. And then the next two weeks, the co-ops have a selection process, they'll have bowling nights, dinner nights, trip hammer, in order to pick, to live in trip hammer, what they do during their Mosey event, they, the students who are trying to get the call join a cook group and cook dinner for the house. So that's their process. And then notification um, for the co-ops takes place on Sunday night, February 17th at 9 p.m. Um, we, any student who does want to mosey into a co-op, we suggest they, go, they also apply for on-campus housing. Um, and that way, if they don't get into the co-op of their choice, they can still participate in the room selection process and they'll know by the room selection process whether they got into that co-op. So um, it's a great experience, it's unique, and it makes my days at work really happy. Good afternoon, my name is Denise Thompson, and I work with Julie Page in the Office of Attorney's and Independent Living, predominantly working on off-campus housing. Essentially, our office is here to help your student in planning and searching for housing and in understanding their lease that they're signing and in documenting the condition of moving in and moving out and just how to be successful whilst living in their residence. We do this by providing many resources, guidance, and tips, and often just an ear to listen. Uh, we have resources available that are on our website and within our office. Um, most of these uh, examples are um, we have a property listings database that our landlords pay to be part of to list the properties that they have available. We have various um, checklists and worksheets, such as the housing search checklist, apartments check checklist, security deposit um, information, security checklist, lease signing checklist, housemate compatibility questionnaires. We offer guides, um, for example, on how to sublet. We offer lease education and lease review, where we 
utilize New York State Tenants Rights Guide. And when needed, we recommend referrals uh, to our students that will hopefully empower them that by contacting these various agencies that they can be successful. Um, so they would either contact the New York State Attorney General's office, <coughs> if the building department, we have a community dispute resolution center here in Tompkins County. Your student received at the beginning of the year a first year letter um, that went out to the freshmen and transfer students from our office and from Carlos's office uh, that explained to them and encouraged our other students to wait before signing the lease. We understand that many students especially our first years, feel that if they don't sign a lease early, they're going to lose out on suitable housing. And that really isn't the case. There's suitable housing all over Cornell campus and within the area. We want to encourage all of our students to explore their options before they sign a lease. They might want to become a residence hall advisor. They might want to participate in a Cornell off-site program, such as going abroad or Cornell in Washington. In rushing into a decision before they're evaluating uh, what they would like to do, they make the situations much more difficult for them. It's important that your student understand that signing a lease is a legally binding contract, and they won't simply be able to change their mind and cancel this lease agreement. This thus will prevent them from joining a new residence hall, a co-op, or living in their fraternity or sorority if they decide to go to recruitment. Many of our landlords require that most of uh, students pay at least the first month's rent, last month's rent, and security deposit. I've currently started reading leases that have first month's rent, last two months' rent, and a security deposit. And this can cost up to over $2,000 a year in advance to your son or daughter moving into their facility. As stated in the first year letter, your students have just arrived here at Cornell. And we need to keep in mind that their social network is going to expand greatly by the end of this year. So the friends they have now may not be the friends that they're going to have at the end of the year. So if after all of this your student wants to experience off-campus living, we would encourage them to visit Julie and myself and our peer advisors in our office. We can go over the entire process with them. We have very active student groups and one of our um, students has stepped forward and have created, with help of Julie, um, the College Town Student Council and they're hosting this year the first annual um, College Town Neighborhood Fair, which is going to be at 309 College Avenue. It's the Fire Hall number nine. Um, we encourage you all to attend. The other thing is that Julie and I will be having a program directly after this about Cornell um, off-campus housing, the journey. If you would like to attend and hear more, um, that will start at 2 o'clock. Turn over to Carlos. Great. Well, thank you all for um, giving your perspective and uh, introduction to each of the communities. Um, so lots of different housing options, a bit overwhelming, um, uh, at least even for me <laughs> at times when I look at everything we have on campus to offer students. So what I'm going to go over is a little bit uh, about not what is available, but how you would secure housing in these various portfolios. Um, and there's also a couple of uh, items on this current uh, PowerPoint slide that are important, uh, such as uh, Q&A sessions and um, sort of tours, etc. So the first one I'll start with is the Housing Expo. Really exciting event. It's a week after your student comes back in the spring, um, a particularly cold day, uh, for better or for worse. And what we do is we hire a charter bus. We pick up your student at Robert Purcell Community Center where you checked in. And we essentially uh, have a loop going from uh, West Campus to the residence halls, Skylar House, uh, 122 McGraw, etc., so that they can have the opportunity over a five hour period to see any particular property that they'd like and also um, ask questions that they might have. Uh, for instance, if they're looking at a particular house and uh, they, they'd like to um, talk to Jared about Flora Rose House, they'll have that opportunity to do so, or if they want to talk to Barnaby about Skylar, etc. So it's a really great opportunity to get all their answers question, uh, all their, excuse me, questions answered uh, from a programmatic standpoint. And in addition, uh, my team will also be present at various sites to answer logistical questions uh, about the uh, room selection process. Um, related to the process, we will be having room selection demos on January 24th and February 27th. So we have one very early, so to kind of uh, assuage some of the anxiety, we have a lot of 
uh, students that want to learn about the process immediately, very studious individuals, which is great. So we have one session uh, then, and then we allow the students to kind of go through uh, various processes, um, whether it's program house room selection, whether it's MOSI, all the different options that they can go through between uh, the end of January and the end of February. And then we typically, once we have the students uh, have a better understanding of the process, what, what they're inclined to, um, uh, to try to secure, you know, secure their housing, we have another demo, uh, demo session on the 27th. So these sessions are very important. Uh, we use uh, particularly the one at the end of the month if they're still interested in going through a general room selection process because we use all the raw data that we've collected from all the signups. We'll give uh, your student projections of what potentially will be available or what historically has been available um, based on their time slot. And um, we'll also answer any questions they have about the physical system or the, the system that they'll interface with to secure housing in March. Um, the program house has a separate application, uh, and they, I believe, are starting to accept applications when they, the students come back in January, and we'll start to review them on February 4th. So, and, and then from there, they will, uh, the student will receive word from the program house sometime between February 4th and February 19th, uh, and they can participate in the room selection process within individual program houses uh, between February 20th and 22nd. So what that means is, let's say your student is, is very interested in Risley. Um, they uh, have an inclination to the creative and performing arts. They can apply directly to Risley uh, and secure their room well ahead of the March general process, which is some students see as a very stressful process. Uh, so some students choose to secure their room in advance of the general process for many different reasons. Um, so please keep that in mind as you're, as you're talking with your summer college. As Julia mentioned, we do have the co-op Mosey. This will be uh, the student's opportunity to go and visit the individual cooperative houses. Uh, and they will be receiving whether or not they were accepted to the house uh, well before uh, both the general room selection process and the program house room selection. So, uh, and I'll give you a, a, a nice calendar timeline on the next slide and kind of walk you through that. We have a lottery sign-up process, which every student is encouraged to do, whether they they have an intent to live on campus or not. Um, as Denise had stated, sometimes plans change. And just because you sign up for the process doesn't necessarily mean that we expect you to select a room on campus. You can definitely use it as a contingency. Um, we, we encourage every student to do so. So for instance, let's say I wanted to get into a particular fraternity. I learned more about that fraternity and got, um, let's say, dissuaded, or let's say I didn't get in. Uh, at least I have the opportunity to go into the general room selection, selection process and pick a room uh, for myself or with my friends. Again, the, the, um, the general or the larger room selection process starts in March. Uh, the process is a five-day um, event. It's uh, the March 4th through the 8th. Uh, if you're a first-year student or if you're a parent, first-year student, uh, your student will go the first two days of the process. So they essentially have kind of the pick of the lot. Um, and that was a switch where formerly seniors went first. There was a switch in the process that the Student Assembly implemented about three years ago, which we fully support. The next bullet is particularly important if your um, student has a particular disability, uh, documented disability, you've been working with Cornell Dis Student Disability Services, uh, their deadline they've communicated to us is February 15th to secure housing for the following academic year for 2013-14. So that's uh, an important date. Uh, and then lastly, if uh, your student goes through the general room selection process or goes through the rooms, uh, excuse me, the program house room selection process or MOSI, doesn't find anything that is appealing to them, they can sign up for a wait list um, from March 11th to the 22nd. So, a lot of information. This is a slide that kind of puts it in perspective uh, in terms of the timeline. So um, in theory, uh, I, if I were a student, uh, excuse me, I could sign up for the lottery, um, receive my time slot, my day immediately. I could go to the, the tours, uh, a few days later and go and visit whichever residence hall or um, house that I, would, I was interested in. I could also at the same time, uh, very close, uh, closely um, within the same time frame, go and visit a cooperative house. 
uh, and also apply to a program house. So we basically set up this timeline so that your student can understand all their options or decisions uh, about all their options before they go on to the next. So they can understand if they get into a cooperative before they get into a potential program house. Or if they don't get into a program house, uh, then they, they know that they need to go into the general room selection process. So we basically, uh, or strategically, um, collaborated and set up a timeline that is most advantageous for your student. A lot of information. I'm sure there's going to be questions. We do have a session in here that starts at 2 o'clock. So we have about maybe 10 minutes for questions uh, at, at the most. But it's a smaller audience.